Hello. Is it working? The final call? All right, the final, final call for the drink. And uh, Greg, this is the last colloquium, right? Okay, good. I just want to. Right, good. Ready to go? I see. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Hello. You hear me okay? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. This is the uh, last colloquium of the 2022 23 academic year. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce one of our own. Give you a little perspective. I think a year ago, we had a faculty search, and then we had, you know, over 100 people apply, you know, eight people select to interview, and some of the ca candidates are local, um, among whom I think Matthias. Um, we have candidates from MIT and Harvard. Some of them willing to come to give in-person talk. We said, no, 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 you can't come. We're just gonna do everybody in Zoom. <laughs> we won't have to treat all the candidates equally. But now, Matthias is here, and he's our youngest faculty member in the department. And Matthias did his PhD in Germany from University of Stuttgart, I think, one of the Max Planck Institute. And then he did a very productive postdoc at MIT with uh, Michael Scranton's group at uh, Chemical Engineering. And then this is how interdisciplinary science is like these days. So we hide him in our, listen to this, soft matter slash biological physics search. So um, so glad Matthias is here, see all the activities on the hallways, you know, equipment shift in. And then while he is busily managing physics 40 this semester, so it's kind of nice to get Matthias to tell us about the scientific work he has been doing. Matthias, here you go. Thank you, Jay. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming. I hope I can meet up to the standards that were just set in the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about fluids and electrodes under confinement in single digit nanopores. Uh, it's work I got, I started working on this topic during my postdoc only um, uh, at MIT in the chemical engineering department. So, you know, my background is physics, but uh, the last couple of years I mostly worked with engineers on, on topics like, uh, like this. And so um, I hope I, I, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's interesting and happening in the field that I think is very interesting for physics. Um, some of the work I've been doing and some of the work that, that's been going on right now in this field. Um, my lab uh, at the moment doesn't exist yet. This is, this is a live shot from, uh, from the seventh floor, uh, but, but construction starting, I'm very excited. Um, but so forgive me, I'm going to refer back to work I've been doing and you know, not that it's been, it's being done right now. I think so, that's a hope. <laughs> um, to be more specific, the talk could be actually more uh, reading like this, water and aqueous electrolytes under confinement in single digit nanopores, just because the, these last uh, couple of years I worked as part of the uh, Center for Enhanced Nanofluidic Transport, which was a DOE funded Energy Frontier Research Center. And um, as you, you know, you may, you may um, uh, understand, you know, water is a very important substance uh, for us as human beings. You all consist 60% of water, so it's very important. Uh, but also for industry, it's very important. And, you know, think about uh, desalination, right? You wanna you wanna remove ions from water uh, in order to do that efficiently at low temperature. You need sort of filtration um, membranes, and so understanding separation processes in, in sort of membranes requires very small pores, and they you know work from an engineering perspective, but from a fundamental perspective, many of the processes that happen in these confined spaces are not well understood, which is why uh, you know there is there is a lot of interest and activity in this field. Uh, also, there has been a dearth of experiments specifically on single digit nanopores, which are pores that are like 10 nanometers or smaller, um, uh, why there has been a lot of theoretical work. So experiments, there have been some breakthroughs in the, in the, in the past decade or so, which I'm going to talk about, which make this field very active, um, uh, like a very active and very exciting field. Um, I just want to start by just highlighting, you know, some of the people I've had the honor to work with in uh, the past couple of years, though most notably my, my former PI, Michael Strano, and a uh, lot of people, uh, this is just a few of them that I work uh, you know, very directly with, but there's many more. Professor Blankstein at MIT, who's a, who's a theorist, 
uh, Arun Majumdar at Stanford, who does experiments, and uh, Professor uh, Narayana Ru at UT Austin, who's, uh, who's also, he's a mechanical engineer, does a lot of molecular dynamics simulations, some of which I'm going to show. Um, so again, water is this very important substance. Um, why um, is it interesting to look at the molecular scale? You know, what, you know here's just a, a reminder that you know, water is this very unique uh, substance, actually that is not fully understood even now in the 21st century. It consists of these polar molecules. Um, it forms, uh, you know, tends to form four H bonds, uh, hydrogen bonds on average, right, it's in the bulk. Has an extremely high dielectric constant, you know, <clears throat> um, that enables it to be a universal solvent. So these molecules will arrange around uh, any sort of uh, ion or even molecules in the liquid. Uh, and it has extremely high specific heat. So many outstanding properties, as you know, right, and anomalies uh, that we learn about in uh, basic physics courses. Um, <clears throat> here is something that is very interesting. It's called the Grotto's mechanism. It's the mobility, you know, of a proton in, in water by this sort of jumping from, from water to water without actually having to physically displace, which makes this species an extremely uh, potent, um, you know, very, very highly mobile species in, in, in water, um, much more mobile than, than most of these uh, alkali ions or <clears throat> halogens. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Here's just a picture of of solvation, so when you put like a salt in water, you know it dissolves. What actually happens on the on the picture of these ions is that these these individual ions get like they acquire these solvation shells, and they move with the solvation shell in water. And uh, this is something that when you think about you know the partitioning of ions into pores later on will be a penalty. So if you want to if you want an ion to go enter a very small space, very often this shell has to be shed partially or has to be de deformed or has to be shed entirely. And that, that constitutes a barrier for entering into pores. And that's something that, you know, at the base of very small pores is actually very, very important. Um, here, an inspiration of biology that, yes? It's very fast, yeah. I think it was there, right? Sodium is like five, so it's like five times higher. So the protons are much, much faster just because they don't have to physically like move, but they can just like jump between neighboring water molecules very quickly. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so I, I was going to say nature actually, actually exploits confinement effects. You know, for example, in these membrane proteins. So you have to imagine this is a protein uh, and it sits in a membrane. The membrane is not shown. And so this protein is called aquaporin. It's a pore that lets water per, uh, permeate from you know, inside the cell to the outside. You know, it's, it's very, these, these molecules you find in biology a lot. And what it does, this molecule is, it confines water to a single chain and it does so with a specific structure. So most of this actually, the white part here is, is non-polar. Um, so uh, water doesn't like it. And then there are some, some regions here which have a lot of charge um, and they constitute what's called a selectivity filter. Um, this is actually a molecular dynamic simulation in which like one water molecule here has been uh, labeled in, in yellow uh, just to, for you to be able to look at it. Um, what I, I, I actually, when you look at this video, you don't see what, what I think they, they say is happening. So I'm just going to, 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 to tell you from this um, study, which was back in 2002, the authors concluded that at the selectivity filter, what happens is um, the, these, these groups, they are forced the molecule to flip 180 degrees. And as a result, when this water comes, the water chain goes from the top to the bottom, every water molecule is being flipped 180 degrees actually selects against protons. So it, it cuts off the mechanism I, I showed you earlier, this Grotto's mechanism where protons can efficiently transport by rotating this, this water molecule. And so these pores are, they allow water to permeate really, really fast, 10 billion water molecules per second, but they don't really allow protons to pass. And it's important because protons are charged if you let like protons pass through a membrane, I mean, you, you sort of get in trouble with like charge balance. So it, these, these molecules sort of, um, um, they use confinement effects to build these extremely nice functionalities that you know, we can now think about, can we do something like that in applications? Can we engineer systems like that that have similar properties? Something that you know, lets you know, certain molecules permeate fast, others not. Um, there's a lot of applications there that I'm not going to talk about much more in this talk. I'll stay on the fundamental side. Okay, um, at the expense of uh, this being anticlimactic, um, this is a solid state nanopore. It's a carbon nanotube that uh, people we work with in, in Lawrence Livermore National Lab here have put into a vesicle 
Um, and they, they are able to put a concentration gradient on the inside and the outside and, and measure the permeability of these pores. And surprisingly, you'll find that in narrow CNTPs, so 0 0.8 nanometer diameter carbon nanotubes, the permeation of water is actually even faster than aquaporin. So we have solid state systems like these, which even outperform to some extent what nature can do. So understanding these systems is, is uh, you know, will be enabling to engineer, uh, you know, future uh, technologies in terms of filtration and so on. Um, uh, but it requires like, you know, fundamental study. So this is just an example. Um, so here are some scales, yeah. So that, that's not the case. Proton, yeah, yeah it doesn't. It's, it, yeah, it, it loses the selectivity against protons, but still the, you know, the permeability for water is extremely high. Um, <clears throat> um, so, so here is the scale. So, so I, I think I made the argument that size does matter in these systems. Uh, if you look at my, but, but they're all interesting, right? And I know there's a lot of work uh, at Brown and all these scales, and they're, they're, all, they're all interesting. interesting. Uh, this talk is going to be focusing on the lower scale here. I uh, just wanted to point out that if you look at, say, you know, this type of water, which is macrofluidic, uh, we typically know how to describe it, right? Navier-Stokes equation applies. Uh, the transport is bulk governed. We can use, like, hagen poisson equation to describe flow. Ohm's law applies if it's an electrolyte, typically. If we go to smaller scale, like micro-nanofluidics here, uh, we start to see uh, surface-governed transport. Very often, surfaces have charge, and the charge on the surface will, you know, modify your fluidic properties. And so fr we use different frameworks here, like Poisson Hans Planck equations uh, and so on. But in the very small scale, say 10 nanometers or lower, which is what I call single digit nanopores here, uh, there is a lot of new physics going on that, that has yet to be uh, you know, accurately described. And many theories fail here. Um, Navier-Stokes equation surprisingly works well down to like one nanometer. That's where below that, you know, viscosity is just like not defined anymore uh, that well. But, uh, but it works down to one nanometer. Other, you know, mean field theories or continuum approaches just fail at different, you know, specific uh, nanometers uh, between, uh, between these scales here. And so I'm going to, I, I thought I'd take uh, the time today to talk about a few examples to show that really there's interesting new physics coming in here, um, <clears throat> this being a physics audience. And so I thought I'd start by saying a little bit about, you know, recent advances, especially in solid state single digit nanopores. I already mentioned an example and I'll keep talking about CNTs a little bit. Uh, then talk about friction and ion permeability. This is work um, you know, that has mostly been done by Lideric Bouquet in Paris and some of our collaborators here uh, in the United States. And um, <clears throat> then come to phase transitions and direct fluid sensing, which is uh, where, where I've been working on these past years um, <clears throat> and give some, you know, give some expectations and outlook for the future. So solid state uh, single digit nanopores, I mentioned carbon nanotubes are and will be a player in this field for, for the next uh, decade or so, at least because, uh, you know, if you look at the textbooks, you know, you may have not already been born when, when they were first reported, 1991 uh, is the first time that carbon nanotubes were, were reported in literature. It's 30 years, but like it's been really challenging system to work with. So a lot of the uh, tools we need to make them useful nanophilic tool only came about in the last decade or so. Um, if you look in textbooks, typically what you see is this sort of like graphene picture, and then when you roll it, you get carbon nanotubes. It's of course not what nature does, but you can think about it like this. And so there is this vector C here, which is the circumference, and it's, it's a chiral vector uh, that depends on the uh, real space lattice vectors A1 and A2 of graphene. And so depending on how you curve your CNT, you'll get different properties. Uh, properties, you know, can vary specifically between the tube being metallic and semiconducting, depending on how you roll it up. And so nature actually gives this extremely finely interspersed diameter space here where CNTs exist, and they, they exist even at larger diameters. But so it's a nice tool, actually. We can go in and select, if you want, like 0 0.9 nanometer, anything between here. Like we can, if you're able to resolve it, we can actually do very finely resolved diameter studies in nanofluidics in this space. Um, this has been realized very early on, so 1992, one year after the discovery of CNTs. People already dreamt that uh, they would be highly polarizable molecular straws. They would, you know, you could you could put fluids in and then study these. Uh, hasn't happened like tw in 20 years after that. Um, mm, people suggested then that mm, there may be a cutoff, so certain molecules won't go in, but like water and organic solvents should probably do that. <clears throat> Even though, you know, CNTs are hydrophobic, so there was a big question, it's like, why would they go in? And if they went in, like, we would hopefully be able to do like really chemistry under, refinement, uh, under confinement. Uh, all these sorts of things where like <clears throat> re reaction rates are different than in the bulk. 
So to really be able to do that, we first have to put fluids in. And it was like only 10 years after the initial discovery of CNPs that an MD simulation really made a big impact in this field, where Homo and coworkers looked at this very small pore, like the one that I showed you in the beginning, <clears throat> and they put like water in and they saw it forms this chain, this single file chain you never see in bulk water ever. And they suggested this would have very different properties than bulk water in terms of like transport rates. They, they predicted, you know, sort of like correlated movements of this very fast, rapid burst-like motion in the CNT. And this sparked a lot of interest and finally experiments that were able to show it actually does fill with water. Um, in terms of the driving force though, it really depends, like why does water actually wanna go in there? So depending on diameter, the answers are different. So in, in, in a big chunk here, it's actually entropy dominated. So water in the bulk um, has, uh, <clears throat> when, it, when it goes into the CNT, it actually gains a lot of freedom to rotate, much more than in the bulk which is like a driving force to, to, actually, uh, to actually put it in. Um, but it actually varies and it's quite, dis uh, you know, or like it, it, this is a suggestion uh, that, that this should be, you know, why, why it actually flows. Um, <clears throat> here's how people study it. I'm just showing that, you know, it took quite 10 years to actually make, to figure out that when you make CNTs typically in powders in the beginning, you actually do have to separate them. You have to individualize them because when they're on powders, you'll never be able to see, um, uh, any optical transition, which was believed to be a very good tool between uh, these Van Hofer singularities in the, in the density of states here, um, because you also have metallic tubes. As soon as they're in contact with metallic tubes, you quench any photoluminescence. So if people had first to take powders, put them in solution, put surfactants in, sonicate to individualize them, and then they were able to do photoluminescence. So now we know this is a, these are plots you see in the field over and over again, where people can you know, vary emission ratings and get excita like, uh, excitation ratings and get emissions at very different energies for these different CNTs. So you see like 13.6 is here, 12.8, 11.9. And uh, I'm showing this plot just because it's busy actually. Uh, you see there's all these CNTs and, and people actually do you know, achieve you know, filling with all these different molecules, including water, which is down here. Uh, so, so, so we know from a fact that, that we can actually do this. Um, <clears throat> and so this makes this a very useful platform. Um, another development is 2D materials. Um, you know, since graphene, there has been a lot of work there. Uh, we have been working, for example, here on uh, graphene that we grow by chemical vapor deposition, and we, we actually make defects in the graphene during the growth immediately. Um, and so the grad student who was the lead author on this, on this work here uh, did a careful job in basically growing a lot of defects but keeping them small. Keep having a lot of defects that are small in a anatomically thick membrane um, has, you know, sparks the hope that we can have very high selectivity at the same time very high permeance. The thinner the membrane, the higher the permeance, the, thin, the smaller the defect, and the, the more the possibility that it's actually selective. So here's selectivity of H2 versus methane uh, plotted as permeance. And so here's a membrane, polymer membrane limit, uh, assuming a membrane of like one micrometer thickness. And you can actually see these graphene results here are indeed higher permeance and higher selectivity, but it's always a trade-off. Uh, as you can see in this Robson plot, it's a trade-off of permanence versus selectivity. Um, more physics-y maybe is, you know, doing this on single defects. So here I'm showing an example of an MOS2 pore. It's a single pore in a membrane. And so what people did here is apply, you know, biases across this pore. And so if the pore is big, you see sort of ohmic behavior here in the current versus voltage characteristic. When the pore gets smaller, essentially your current, you know, just drops. But if you make this pore extremely small, at some point you transition between a linear regime here to a nonlinear regime, and nonlinear regimes are very unusual. And so what the authors suggest here is that what, what they see as the signature is ionic Coulomb blockade. So an analog of what's you know, known in electronics where you know, the, the fact um, that whether you observe a current or you don't observe a current depends on the charge of the island here, which is uh, governed by the surface charge on this pore uh, in this very center here. <clears throat> so sort of like, in an analogy to what, what happens very often in solid state physics, it's like you have a measurement like this, current versus voltage, it looks peculiar, and you need to really dig into the physics in order to understand it, right? It doesn't immediately tell you that it's a very um, unusual effect. <clears throat> um, of course, something that I'm very excited about um, in this field is that you can actually take these different 2D materials uh, and stack them. Leo knows very well how to do this, and so this has enabled uh, one really cool advance in the field, namely that you can build these, uh, these structures where you actually etch, uh, you can, before you stack them, these Lego pieces, you can etch out certain parts here to make spaces. 
And so here's a cross section where you see a stack of graphene, 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 and in the middle there is like open spaces. And so these form channels for confinement. It's actually possible to make this as thin as like uh, two atomic layers or one. So here's examples of measurements on like, you know, these uh, only, only two sheets have been taken out here. Uh, and so you can see conductance curves as a function of concentration for different ions. And so here there's, a, it's actually, a, a, these platforms allow you to, to actually look at, you know, steric effects versus charging effects, right? Uh, <clears throat> which ions uh, can enter the pore easily, which don't. And so there's um, a link you can make between uh, the energy that you need to desolvate these ions. And this, this differs here for different cations. You see the, the, the ones that are like multivalent, it's uh, very hard to strip off the solvation shell. So they, they, they don't enter the pore as much as, or as easily as for example, potassium. So really cool system. Uh, and of course, as you, can, as you can imagine, like this can be engineered in different geometries and will definitely be uh, allowing a lot of really cool experiments going forward. Okay, I'm already talking a lot. Um, I'll, I'll try to cut short on the next two parts. Um, the, fir the first one I wanna talk about is friction. Um, talking about this because it highlights the importance of quantum effects in these small systems. Okay, so, um, um, so just as, a, as, a, as an introduction here, very often in these large scale systems, when you look at hydrodynamic textbooks and you look at a flow profile uh, at the, the boundary to a wall, you will see that the flow velocity actually goes to zero at the wall. It's called the no slip boundary condition. And there's been tons of experiments showing yeah, this actually applies in pretty much all the systems. But if you go to very small scale, what happens is that, you know, in, in experiments, we do see finite slip and it matters. <coughs> And so a way to consider this actually is, um, is, is, you know, you need a different boundary condition here. And this one has been proposed by Navier himself, uh, which is you define the slip velocity here as uh, the gradient of the velocity profile at the wall times uh, B, which is the so-called slip length, or the length beyond the wall at which the extrapolated uh, velocity profile goes to zero. And you can also think about this in terms of an equilibrium um, between different stresses. So here's the force uh, at the boundary here, being the area times the viscous stress. And the viscous stress can be written as the, uh, the viscosity times, uh, you know, the velocity gradient here. And if you, you know, in a general case, just assume a linear relation to the, to, to the slip, uh, then you can write this in this way, where lambda is the friction coefficient. Taking these two together, you can see that the slip length here um, is suggested to be sort of just a ratio between the viscosity and a molecular coefficient that defines friction at the wall, okay? <clears throat> Now, this is uh, a plot I assembled for a review that we recently published where I look at uh, actually f sort of friction measured in CNTs, okay? So here the CNT diameter is very big and, and becomes smaller and you see as the diameter gets smaller, what people see is the flow of water through these CNTs becomes enhanced. By enhancement, um, you know, it's basically just the ratio here of the measured permeability versus the no slip permeability and uh, the difference here is actually just defined by the slip length. So you go smaller in radius, your flow enhances, means your slip length enhances. So how, how can this be, be understood? So one, one um, <clears throat> yeah, in fact, the picture is more nuanced. So for interior water, uh, indeed from molecular dynamics simulations, it's been suggested that slip length increases or the friction coefficient, as uh, slip length increases or uh, friction coefficient decreases as you go to lower diameter. But for water on the outside, it's quite the opposite. Uh, versus water on a flat graphene sheet here um, doesn't show any dependence on, <coughs> on radius, which here is just the, and just the distance between, uh, between these walls. Um, so um, a different way to think, or like a way to fruitfully think about the friction coefficient here uh, um, stems from mm, you know, looking at the Kubo, green Kubo formalism that relates this, uh, this coefficient to basically um, <coughs> the correlation in, in the, uh, the equilibrium um, uh, correlation in the in the friction force, and uh, by uh, you know crude approximations that you can do, you can you can it can actually be shown that this friction coefficient can be related to the number of water molecules per area at the interface times um, sort of the amplitude of of the uh, of the wall or the the uh, the force potential at the wall uh, times a uh, structure factor here. This is the structure factor of the liquid. Okay, the structure factor of the liquid actually looks like this. <clears throat> um, and, and so for example, here the green arrow is the case for a flat graphene sheet uh, where it sits somewhere here. So you basically look at commensurability effects. The more commensurable your water is with your underlying surface, um, <clears throat> the more friction you would have. So the flat, the flat one is here 
uh, you put water on the inside, you you'll be the, you'll be going towards this uh, uh, this point here. So this go this goes down, friction goes down. If you put water on the outside, uh, uh, you you'll go up this slope. Um, so that's what's been what's been suggested. However, um, <coughs> the experiment shows that you know the slip length or um, the inverse of the friction coefficient, you know, scales already quite a bit here at radii which are much bigger than this. So something else must be going on. And so a recent development actually looks at many body physics effects. I don't want to. I'm not going to go into, into too many details here, but but there, it's a it's possible for for this scenario here to get sort of a closed expression. And what they suggest here is that the 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 force, <coughs> uh, the friction force can actually be uh, is actually composed of two components: the classical com component that I just discussed, and and a quantum so-called quantum friction term. And the quantum friction term here is suggested to come from uh, basically coupling of collective modes in the water phase and in the wall. So essentially, you look at um, electronic fluctuations, uh, charge fluctuations in your water near a wall, which has like electronic, um, <coughs> electronic excitations. And the more, say, your, um, uh, the energy of your excitations uh, resembles, uh, so, or like has the same similar frequency, the more actually water can lose momentum when it flows over these surfaces by doing excitations in the electronic system, okay? Um, this is basically just a bit, bit hand waving, but like, so water has what's called the Dubai peak um, <coughs> uh, that, that has um, you know, pretty low dispersion when you look at the wave vector, um, but it has basically this peak here at a couple of 10 uh, milli eV. And now in the solid, we can actually distinguish. So in this study here, they looked at uh, you know, what, what, what graphene does. So graphene has the surface plasmon here, which, which shows very big dispersion. Um, <coughs> Uh, or versus what graphite does. So graphite has low-lying um, surface pl uh, plasma modes, which are actually z in z direction of the of the graphite, and um, so they are these these modes uh, don't even show any dispersion here. They 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 um, you know uh, compare very well with the excitation frequencies in water, and so this proximity suggests that you know water can uh, relax momentum into electronic excitations in graphite. Uh, very easily versus in graphene, there is not a lot to couple with because this, this mode here disperses a lot and then there is nothing, nothing more to couple with. Um, <clears throat> so as a result, if you look at you know, these experiments here which were done on multi-wall tubes in large radii where these modes actually, uh, these tubes look like graphite stacked, you have these Z uh, plasmon modes which, uh, uh, in, into which, uh, you know, into which you, you can, the water can dissipate um, momentum very efficiently, so there's high friction here versus at low radius, when you have curvature, you start to decouple the sheets electronically, um, your friction goes, uh, goes down. Okay, so with this, they were able to sort of map this. I'm showing this to suggest that, um, you know, this sort of hints at the importance of quantum effects in these very small systems and are, you know, things that um, need to be taken into account when you want to accurately determine uh, flow and even electrokinetic properties in these systems. Okay, moving on. Um, want to say another case study sort of is about ion permeability and correlations. So when you have a pore in a solid state system like this, <coughs> what is known is that if you have you know, ions in your solution, they will come and screen surface charges in this pore. So surface charges are pretty much uh, ubiquitous. It's hard to have a system where there is no surface charge. So generally there is, and ions will come in and screen. And the length of over which the charge is screened is determined by the so-called the by length which depends uh, on the inverse of uh, the, the uh, square root of the ionic strength. So ionic strength being essentially the, the concentration of your ion. So the higher you have a concentrated electrolyte, uh, the shorter the screening will be, and you will you'll sort of like get this sort of uh, channel conductance here, which is pretty much like bulk conductivity times uh, cross section of your channel uh, di divided by the length. Now, if you decrease this concentration, you'll see that the, the by length becomes longer. Longer the by length means at some point you'll have overlap, and so in your channel, you'll only have counter ions accumulating. And so in this case here, you, you start to have surface governed transport. Surface governed transport corrects this equation by this uh, term here. And so in, in experiments, what you should see is uh, a deviation from your bulk, um, bulk behavior into a surface governed behavior here. Um, this has been seen in experiments. Derek Stein has been one of the authors uh, of this paper here in 2004. <coughs> Um, CNTs are different. So again, I'm showing, you know, don't have to look at this in detail. I just want to show here different CNTs. And what is found is that the slope is very different. So here the slope 
which should be zero um, in the surface, gov if, if it was surface governed, is like one third in this system. It's um, two thirds in another system. And it can vary between one and minus, uh, one, and, one, and, one and a half uh, in, in a third system, depending on pH. So there's a lot more going on <coughs> that is not captured by the simple surface, um, surface charge picture. And so um, a recent, um, recent work here by, by Yoav Green uh, out, of, out of Israel uh, suggests that um, you know, the slip length we just talked about actually kicks in here. And uh, it can actually amplify uh, your, um, it can actually amplify your exponent alpha um, <clears throat> to, to go anywhere between zero and one. So slip length and, um, and also charge at the pores, at the pore mouth, are factors that seem to you know, dominate uh, this, uh, this regime here in carbon nanotubes, but uh, it's not yet fully understood. Um, okay, um, just a fun recent development that I wanted to highlight is here's a system uh, that I mentioned earlier, carbon nanotubes in, in these uh, vesicles. And uh, what, what our um, uh, friends here at Lawrence Livermore did is they sort of tested the, the Nernst Einstein relation. The Nernst Einstein relation is a fundamental relation between the diffusion coefficient of a certain ion and its electrophoretic mobility. And so what they did is they separately measured diffusion coefficient and electrophoretic mobility in two separate experiments. Unfortunately, not the exact same experiment. Um, but what they, what they can see here is um, sort of when they, so here it's like an osmotic uh, shock experiment. So you change uh, concentration of potassium very quickly and then you see uh, from a fluorescence tracer on the inside how much uh, potassium goes into the, into the vesicle. Uh, and from this, you can sort of extract the diffusion coefficient and they find it to be, you know, this number 10 to the minus 13, which is three orders of magnitude lower than in the bulk, in bulk water. Uh, versus here in the electrophoretic mobility experiment where you see, you know, depending on the number of CNTs that's inserted in, in the lipid membrane here, uh, you'll get sort of these peaks. From this, you can extract mobility to these seven, you know, 10 to the minus eight, which is pretty much the bulk electrophoretic mobility. So the comparison between these tools, you know, shows a three orders of magnitude dilation of this equation, <clears throat> which is something that's not even found in like, in like protein cores. Um, of course, Einstein, you know, was not wrong. Uh, you know, an assumption in this equation is that um, the processes that limit diffusion and that limit electrophoretic mobility are the same. But in these CNTs, it's not, it's not the same. And so uh, one thing uh, that was like found out in molecular dynamics simulations that you know, suggests a possible mechanism here is that you know, under an applied electric field, which you don't see here, but you see water permeates very fast as a chain. And the moment that a potassium ion enters, you see this chain breaks down completely. And then you have just a cluster here moving across the pore. <clears throat> and you, you see these, uh, these ion water clusters moving, which is something that in diffusion doesn't happen in the system. And so the processes for diffusion and for uh, electrophoresis uh, are very different. So in a sense, the equation doesn't apply, you know, but you, know, you, you can also say it's violated. Um, okay. Uh, last but not least, I just wanted to say that uh, in general, in these single digit nanopores, a feature that, that, is, that is general here is that electric field lines uh, are confined inside the channel just because of the contrast of dielectric uh, content inside the channel and outside the channel. If you confine field lines to the inside the channel, you know, in these single digit nanopores, uh, what it means is that you know, Coulomb interactions between ions get enhanced. <clears throat> and so, Many theories that we have, you know, developed for, you know, <clears throat> that typically work in like low concentration electrolytes, even in like nanopores, uh, they can they can become violated when you go into like higher concentration regimes, uh, because of because of this um, increased uh, correlation. And one one um, consequence of this is, for example, the formation of ion pairs. Um, it's a little bit better better shown in this simulation where it's like a 2D um, water ion sort of an aqueous electrolyte. And you see that these ions here form pairs. It's called gerund pairs. They basically leave their solvation shell and sit plus minus ion right next to each other. They have a certain time over which, which they live and then they dissociate and then they can associate again. And this uh, can start to determine your transport behavior. <clears throat> uh, what's shown here also is that uh, under an applied electric field, you can also, they can even form poly electrolytes. So they, you have many pairs form like chain like structures together and so, of course, this will also impact your, your transport. So, for example, here it's been suggested that in some of these conditions, you can actually form like these membristic loops where the uh, current will depend on the history of the way you cycle the potential you apply to your system. 
So this can be interesting for making you know, memory store elements or information storage device. Okay, uh, now switch gears a little bit. Sorry for the switching gears, but I think it's like, I just wanna highlight these different aspects that govern uh, transport and um, behavior in these systems. And so the next one is uh, work that, that I've been working on these past years a lot is looking at phase behavior. So um, if you think of just confinement in terms of like, you know, <clears throat> more um, continuum like picture here, um, this is the Gibbs Thompson, so called Gibbs Thompson expression that defines melting depression uh, in systems as the system size is reduced. So if you think about water, you know, the bulk melting point is uh, what you all know is zero degrees Celsius. When you put water in smaller and smaller pores, this melting point is predicted to decrease just because of the increased importance of, you know, interaction with the wall uh, <clears throat> and, and, you know, and the radius that, that comes in here. So um, this is the sort of bulk prediction, continuum the, the prediction, and it actually matches experiment pretty well, down to about 1.5 nanometers. So these are all from X-ray diffraction studies that have been done in the early 2000s. Uh, at about 1.5 nanometer, you start this, you see this uh, deviation. So Gibbs-Thompson behavior breaks down. Of course, the question we have is like, how much does it break down? How does it actually depend on the pore size? These early experiments, as you see, they were always done on like uh, different, uh, on ensemble studies where you have different pore diameters. So only fairly recently, like optical tools have been used to sort of like uh, get individual tube um, um, thermodynamics, so put water in a single tube, study that single tube and see how, you know, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, where the melting point is as a function of uh, temperature. And so here, these are two different studies, two different tools, uh, they look at two different things. And you see indeed both of them show discontinuous behavior as a function of diameter, which is very interesting. However, they also seem to disagree quite a bit. I'm zooming in here. You see like the, the, the disagreement is on the order of like 100 degrees Celsius, or 100 Kelvin, which is actually unacceptable. It seems unacceptable. At the same time, molecular dynamic simulations, which is like black and gray, also seem to you know <clears throat> disagree quite a bit. Um, so uh, we started like um, refining the systems we use to to study this. Um, just going to show here, uh, you know, these are sort of the two tools that it, that have been used in these studies: the photoluminescence and Raman spectroscopy. Photoluminescence looks at the uh, at the uh, optical transition energy. That's actually an excitonic transition. And you see when you, when you increase water vapor pressure, what will happen is water will accumulate on the outside of the CMT, similar on, on the inside, but in this particular study here, it was on the outside. What happens is your dielectric screening changes, so your exciton has a different energy, <coughs> uh, depending on the presence or the absence of exterior water. For Raman, the, the physics is very different. So what happens here is that uh, when you have like a fluid you know, present on the outside, same on the inside in terms of the, the physics, I'll show that in a second, uh, what will happen is it'll couple by Van der Waals coupling to your CMT wall, and that coupling will change your, uh, a, a specific breathing mode frequency that we can read out in Raman spectroscopy. Um, so here is uh, how this can be understood in terms of mathematics. This is the governing equation for radial displacement of the CMT. Looks pretty much like Hooke's law, and, and as you know, when you solve Hooke's law, you get a frequency. So the frequency is here depends on the inverse of diameter. So that, that's pretty well known for, the, for this mode. Now, if you put something like a fluid on the inside or the outside, what happens is this law is modified a bit. Uh, effectively, a spring constant increases in strength and that shifts your, your RBM frequency actually to the same direction, irrespective of where you place the fluid. Um, this sort of expression also allows you to sort of like extract the density. So it can be, you can decompose this, uh, this um, a coupling constant here as a coupling constant for molecule and a molecular density. So it's a tool to get density. Uh, but it's very different from PL. Uh, here we look at different experiments that have been done as a function of diameter where you get this shift and you actually see that there is sort of like a, sort of like a well shape emerging here at low diameter, which we think is related to uh, you know, molecular packing effects that we start to see uh, using this, this technique. <clears throat> uh, we also suggest that uh, what's actually nice is if you can take a double wall nanotube, you can actually separate the effect of coupling on the inside and the outside. By, by the fact that when you couple, when you, when you have two walls, they couple like a, like a classical coupled oscillator, you get two frequencies, and now one of them corresponds more to the spacing of the inner wall, the other to the outer wall, and you can decouple the effects of where, where fluids are. And so a very nice, actually, tool <coughs> to specifically sense uh, fluid on a specific position. And so here's studies we've been, we've been doing. Actually, this was before my time, but here's a double wall nanotube. Um, you know, the inner wall, uh, our RBM is, is here, 
and they put water on the system and wait for water to come into this spot that was probed in Norma, and you see at a certain point like this upshift, which corresponds to filling. Um, we have innovated this platform by segmenting these CNTs, so we get like physically separated entities of the same pore, which is actually very powerful uh, uh <coughs> in terms of you know reproducible nanofluidics. So you can have the same system and probe it over and over again. Some of them will actually fill when you put them in water, and some of them will remain empty. So you have like a built-in control of filled and empty systems. Um, this is showing that yes, we get you know. Uh, filled and emptied pretty much by a model. We also see like partial filling states. I'll, I'll talk more about this. Um, <clears throat> and we can have these things freestanding. And freestanding allows us to even, you know, be more sure about what the system actually is. So here a double wall tube, you know, we can predict the chiralities. Um, we can see, you know, how the system looks like. <clears throat> so here's uh, thermodynamic studies we did uh, where we have these different segments and we put them in water. Uh, after fib cutting, we show that only fib cutting, you know, is required uh, to open these CNTs and some of them will fill. This here is an upshift in these RBM modes and others will remain empty. And then if, if you heat uh, fill segments versus empty segments, you know, empty segments won't do anything much, but fill segments will show this sort of transition here in the frequency, which we attribute to a liquid vapor transition. So liquid vapor transition is something we've, we've studied quite a bit over this, uh, this past year. And to understand this a bit from a theoretical side, we did grand canonical um, sort of molecular dynamics simulations where we couple um, sort of like this open system here to a particle reservoir and then a thermal reservoir. Actually different because in our experiment we do only local heating. So this was a sort of innovative approach to, to have two reservoirs here, particle and thermal, which are different. And uh, you know, the, the behavior we get looks a bit like this. And you know, it seems, uh, it's suggested that indeed it is sort of like can be reproduced by uh, absorption like physics. <clears throat> so motivated by this, we look at you know, these measurements that we did um, we mathematically can convert this change in frequency to a change in coverage. And from the coverage, you know, we can take a sort of an absorption model to describe the, this sort of transition, uh, phase transition that's, that's going on here between a sort of a vapor phase and a liquid phase. And we can do that for like different scans. We repeat these over and over. We have like, there's like hundreds of, of scans or like dozens of tubes uh, that we did. Uh, we can do this to, to extract these, uh, these enthalpies that describe phase change. And what we find curiously is that they actually vary quite a bit over small diameter ranges here. Um, <clears throat> um, interestingly enough, it seems like also from just analyzing um, um, uh, simulations we did uh, based on this uh, statistical physics expression here, we can actually also reproduce uh, these uh, very, you know, discontinuous changes here as a function of diameter in this space. And afterwards it tends to level off towards, uh, towards like a <clears throat> sort of bulk um, or like flat graphene like behavior. Uh, continuum models themselves, so these are like um, uh, equation of state uh, models um, that don't um, take into account molecular packing or whatever, they, they don't show any of this, uh, of these uh, discontinuous trends here. So we believe this is a unique effect that we only see in very small, small confinement. <clears throat> um, just to mention, we also observe in some cases uh, systems where we have fractional packing, so here are like partially filled CNTs. Um, we we study their uh, thermodynamics here in terms of capillary condensation, um, but this is something we don't see very often. Uh, but we recently published this. Um, you know, surprisingly, we found very small uh, capillary condensation, much smaller than than in the bulk. Um, okay, so ju I just just showing this to say we did a lot of work on using optical spectroscopy in the past, and I think it'll be uh, a good opportunity to basically um, combine, you know, say Raman and PL and or maybe even other techniques uh, that allow you to like, you know, probe the fluid more directly. But so far, I think you've seen that a lot of these probes um, are rather indirect. We read out the CNT vibration to probe the fluid. We read out the CNT exciton to probe the fluid. Um, but uh, one thing that is, um, that the field really needs is probes that are more direct. And so one thing, um, we've been taking steps in this direction. So here, this is the tube I showed in the beginning. Actually, a tube I filled with water and FedEx to Stanford, uh, only for them to make a hole here in the CNT and have the fluid evaporate. But in a sense, you can do this. So you can actually have these individual tubes. You can put fluids in, you can FedEx them. And so we started uh, to use uh, <coughs> basically monochromatic electrons, or like, there is no electron laser, but, uh, but there is now electron microscopes that are extremely monochromatic, and they allow you to do um, um <coughs> vibrational spectroscopy right in the TEM. 
Uh, these are very special electron microscopes with a you know, very high energy resolution, and that allows you to see phonon modes. So one thing that, that they see or compare here is water in a silicon nitride liquid cell, and you have this sort of OH stretch mode, which is 420 MeV. And when they look at a system like this, actually this mode shifts quite a bit to 460 MeV. Um, and, and we believe it's a signature of like the interfacial uh, water that is more free than, than the bulk water. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, there, this has been recently just shown at the APS March meeting, but uh, we, we are very excited about the opportunity to here basically be able to probe the confined fluid directly without having a mediator uh, in a sense. And there's a lot that, that, that will be uh, done in this space. <clears throat> these are some early and lead predictions here for, the, for these modes. And that also suggests that when you go into smaller and smaller CNTs, you should start to see a peak like this emerge at a, at a higher frequency, which could reflect the signal we observe. Um, another cool development, and I'll end on this note. Yeah, I think I'm good, I'm good in time. Um, this is what we did in the past, in the past years on uh, something that's pretty cool. It's um, defects on boron nitrides, so a 2D material um, can have atomic scale defects you know, from, for many reasons. And what happens is that, ben, that boron nitride itself is an insulator, so you can't really do much optics with it, right? Band gap is huge. But these defects that, that people find on the surface of HBN uh, can be single photon emitters. So, so here the single photon emission is shown in this uh, autocorrelation function <coughs> of a specific spot that emerges uh, when you do PL of these, of these uh, or you scan on the, on the surface of HBN. And uh, there's a couple of things that, that we notice. First of all, there's a whole bunch of different types of emitters. So they have all different energies. <coughs> and so there's a whole discussion of what these emitters actually are. NV, like NV type centers, um, you know, in diamond have been the inspiration here. So, so people say, oh, it's like, a, it's like a nitrogen vacancy or it's like a nitrogen vacancy plus a carbon substitution. And so there's all sorts of thinking about how this looks at the atomic scale. But the fact is you see very many different energies um, here in our work, we suggest that there's even grouping uh, in this specific window of emission energies. And they have interesting features, like they blink, you can make them more stable. So here we have a blinking emitter. And if you, you know, encapsulate it very well, you can make it more stable. Um, <coughs> uh, we, start, we try to link them actually with atomic scale structure, but it's actually a challenge to link optical spectroscopy with a precise atomic structure. So we went quite far, but we, we, didn't, we didn't quite succeed that one, I would say. But um, um, I, I end on this note. This is work from, from Switzerland that's very recent. This is an HBN flake in water. And uh, what you'll see is, uh, so this is super resolution, so <coughs> super resolution images as a function of time. And wherever something bright lights up, it's an emitter being active. And with time, they'll change to dark. So what, what they see is that you know, different, different you know, times you will have emitters lighting up, but then uh, as they light up, they also start to move a little bit where they, where they are, <coughs> or around where they are. So um, what, they, what they've been suggesting, what's going on here is that actually some of these emitters uh, you know, are made active by surface protons, or excess protons in the, in the, in the fluid, um, you know, attaching for a certain amount of time to the, to the defect, making it bright and then leaving again. So, so here's the picture that, 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 that is suggested we have this 2D material here with defects. We have a proton coming in that makes a dark, um, you know, dark uh, state of an emitter here bright because it couple, uh, like, you know, covalently bonds for some time or it attaches to some for some time, and then it leaves. And you can basically see this hopping. You can trace this as a function of time on the surface. So you can reconstruct sort of these paths. Um, it's a very interesting development because. Um, you know, it allows, it, it gives you a probe that you could potentially put in a nanofluidic channel, say, uh, you know, using Van uh, engineering, and then uh, having a local probe of, you know, fluid or fluid constituents, and maybe being able to trace their diffusion rates as a function of applied, you know, field and so on. So this can be a really powerful tool <coughs> to include into uh, nanofluidic uh, devices. All right, uh, I think I'll end on this note. I actually picked out, you know, work uh, mostly I've been doing uh, in, in terms of like electrophilic and uh, nanofluidics these past years. Um, previously, I just want to mention, I also worked on like 2D materials and electrochemistry. I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested about that, but I didn't cover it in this talk. Okay, I think with this, I'll thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, that, so that was for CNT, right? So you have to imagine like CNT, it, like think about a single file regime. Water in the bulk is like has these four hydrogen bonds and ca can't really rotate very freely. You put it in the CNT and it suddenly can rotate quite a bit. So. Um, I think it. I think it should be going on in all sort of con like really confined systems like these. Yeah. I mean, it could. It could be pretty general, but there is certainly you know the interaction that you still have with the wall that could be different from from system to system. Um, I think the specific study has been done specifically on CNT. There's not so many cylindrical you know systems. That's right. 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 Yeah. Sure. Ah, that's very nice. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. We've we've had we've had no we've had discussions on this for like the last uh, three years basically. Yeah, it's not it's not from the spectroscopy itself. It's not that obvious, which is why you know the double wall nanotube uh, something that you know I put a lot of effort in because you know from the from the elastic shell model it really seems that it separates you know, the response on the inside and the outside. When you can, when you can make sure you actually have a double wall tube. Um, so that's actually a challenge, generally. Carbon nanotubes, you make them, but knowing what they are is really difficult. So uh, in our case, we make them, we don't know what they are. We, we, we go all the way up to TEM, go in, do diffraction, and then link that um, to the same position you do your optical spectroscopy. Yeah, and then see the, the shift only on the wall you're interested in, and you can stay, yeah. So it's a bit involved there, but, um, but yeah, it's a good question. Quantum versus uh, thermal, in terms of like activation for the hopping, or I think it's a good question. I mean, very often, you know, I guess you know people would do temperature depends for some over some extent to get like activation barriers. If that's linear, you know, Arrhenius type, whatever, then you would say maybe that's that's what's limiting you. Otherwise, um, uh, I have to think about it. Um, Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't want to be, I don't know. I don't know. I have to, I have to think about it. Yeah. <coughs> It's a good question. Yeah. It's inside. It's inside. Yeah, yeah. It's inside. Yeah. <coughs> no, 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 no. It's uh, it's not a kinetic experiment, right? It's like we we apply a temperature. We sort of we change local temperature. In our case, we actually did just laser heat, right? You locally laser heat a long tube that's open and connected to some reservoir. So that that also plays into the the actual thermodynamics, whether it's open or closed at the end. In, in the case where it's open, you still have like this equilibrium between an outside reservoir and, uh, and basically like a local f gas phase that you create, it's like a vapor phase. You have a gradient in temperature that, that, you know, that you create, but you don't, you don't measure the kinetics we didn't measure. You would just measure the, you basically create it very fast thermal, thermally the system gets to a steady state very quickly. 
and you you basically um, I mean you you have a balance of fluxes there's a temperature there's a thermal flux and then there's a bit of a particle flux and you know but they 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 make a steady state so very in the center you get like a vapor phase yeah. and at some point you have you have a liquid phase Yeah, yeah. So in our case, in our case, we, we basically just sensed uh, the vibration of the C and T of the C and T as a function of temperature, right? Locally. So at some at some point, locally, you measure it, and when you when it's like you know you, when it shifts to a high frequency, you know okay, there is a fluid on the inside. It's a liquid phase, and when it shifts to a lower frequency, it's like a vapor phase, and so it's a it's just a force constant measurement. Yeah, yeah. It's a density change. Oh, um, are you talking about criticality, or? Yeah, the, the liquid vapor has a critical point, right? Where it needs to be fully balanced. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's a cool question. No, we have not been able to, our experimental system didn't allow that, but it would be really cool to do that, yeah. <coughs> <laughs> so, so I, I'm having trouble thinking that um, because the photon density is enormous, the mobility is high. Why is it so easy to do this experiment? Uh, no, it depends. I mean, it depends on pH, right? How many excess protons you have. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of. This chain, yeah. Mm -hmm. But whether or not, right, right, right. But whether or not there is a lot of protons still depends on on your pH. But that's why I mean it's not it's not like there is a there is a finite conductivity of water, right? It's not like it's not zero. No, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, if this wasn't clear, yeah. So the, the data even I showed was, uh, that was not my data, but but they did, there's these um, uh, liquid solid data, which is, which is this. This is liquid solid data. Or like, you know, that it's the ex experimental data people say is liquid solid. Whether that is actually true, I, I don't know. But it's, yeah. Uh, 
Oh, um, so that's a little bit of a different question, right? Uh, so if you think about a, a single chain, that's extreme confinement. You can be a bit less confined, right? Uh, some of these diameters, say 1.4, allows for, say, an annual shell plus an interior filament. So that's a little bit less exact 1D, right? So the exact 1D, I don't think there is a liquid, liquid solid transition. People have observed transitions nonetheless, but they said, they, they called them like quasi phase transition. And there's, there hasn't been a lot of insight because you know the tools are limited. So it was just a PL study and they see, oh, the PL has some humps. And they think it's like a preferential orientation of the water dipole with respect to the wall that at a certain temperature has a certain number and then you, you cool it down and it starts to preferentially be oriented you know, in a different way. And, and that happens. And these uh, don't seem to be um, you know, um, discontinuous transitions either. So they are really, really s a bit smeared and stuff. Um, but yeah. 